start a chapter today on covalent compounds. We will be comparing covalent compounds to ionic ones. You'll have a short little video to do this, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Same learning goal that you've seen for the previous chapter. We will be learning how to name covalent compounds such as carbon dioxide, how to write chemical formulas, but we're also really going to go into depth in drying compounds, determining shapes of compounds, as well as polarity. So covalent compounds will have some similarities with ionic ones, but a lot of key differences. So same learning goal we've all read to use. And we're gonna pick up with chapter six. And again, you're gonna see a little bit of this in the flip lesson as well, which will help you. With covalent compounds, covalent compounds are different than ionic compounds in several ways. One key way is that covalent compounds are formed through the sharing of electrons between two or more atoms, and these atoms will be nonmetals. So with ionic compounds, you saw metallic cation, nonmetallic anion in most cases. Here what you're going to see is two or more nonmetals. Ionic compounds are formed through the transfer of electrons, covalent ones through the sharing of electrons. This little video will help you understand some of the key similarities and differences. And I really like his videos. His hands move a lot, which is a little bit tough to watch. Yeah, but they're good. They're good videos. It's an eight minute video. I'll slide through some of it. And I also want to point a few things he says. He has one typo in here that he makes note of. In this video, we're going to look at compounds of the ions versus compounds of the molecular, also known as covalent. We'll learn how we will tell them apart based on their formulas, and then we'll look at some important differences between them. Thanks, Tyler. So, how can you tell whether something is ionic or molecular? Well, it depends on the elements that make them up. So ionic compounds are made of metals and nonmetals, whereas molecular, also known as covalent compounds, are made of only nonmetals. Let's do a couple practice problems to work on this. You will need a periodic table to do this. Here's the one that I'm using. I've left out a lot of the elements because they're not important. But what is important is a big, thick staircase that divides the periodic table into two parts. So what's on the left side? Metals. Metals and on the right side? Metals. Good. On the mid side of the stick? Couple of examples. The first one, sulfur dioxide. So what are the elements it's made of? It's made of sulfur and oxygen. Both of these are nonmetals, which means that sulfur dioxide, SO2, is a molecular compound. Sodium chloride is made of sodium, a metal, and chlorine, or chloride, which is a non-metal, so sodium chloride is an ionic compound. All right, now, H2O is made of hydrogen and oxygen. Now, you might think that hydrogen is a metal because it's on the side of the periodic table, and it's fine, it's understandable, it can do that, but hydrogen is an exception. Even though it's on the side of the periodic table, it's actually a non-metal. It's the only exception. So hydrogen and oxygen are actually both non-metals, which means that H2O, water, is a molecular or covalent compound. Okay, copper two fluoride, copper is here, fluorine and fluorine is here, metal, non-metal, good thing is ionic. Okay, let's look at a few trickier examples. So far, we've only looked at compounds that have two elements in them, but there's a lot of compounds out there that have more than two elements, okay? So propanol, for example, is made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. All three of these are non-metals, though, so this is still a molecular covalent compound, even though it has um, a bunch of non-metals. Okay, don't be confused by that. Here's another example. Lithium nitrate has lithium, which is a, a metal, but then it also has nitrogen and oxygen, which are both non-metals. So it's still got the metal, non-metal thing going on, so it's an ionic compound, even though it has two non-metals. And the same thing is true with sodium sulfate. And again, that's, that's the typo. And two non-metals, sulfur and oxygen. But metal non-metal means it's ionic. Now, lithium nitrate and sodium sulfate are actually special kinds of ionic compounds because they have 
two different dot elements. They are what are called polyatomic ionic compounds. If you want to learn more about these, I've got videos on them. So now we can look at a chemical formula and we can sort them and we can decide whether something is ionic or whether it's molecular or organic. So what? Who cares? Well, there are some very important differences between ionic compounds and molecular compounds. Let's take a look at some of those right now. So one really important difference is how the atoms in these compounds are held together. In molecular or covalent compounds, the atoms that make them up are held together because they're sharing electrons. Here's what I mean. Water, H2O, is a very common molecular compound. It's made of one oxygen and two hydrogens, and these lines between the atoms show that they're connected, and they mean that they're connected because they're sharing electrons. Here's how I like to think about this. It's like oxygen and hydrogen both have these little hands, and the hands are joined together, it's like they're holding hands, and they're holding hands because they both are trying to hold on to a pair of electrons, which I've drawn here in red. So we've got oxygen and hydrogen connected together because they're holding on and sharing these electrons here. That's what makes the atoms connect and stick together in a molecular covalent compound. Okay? Now, on the other hand, in an ionic compound, the atoms aren't being so nice to each other. Okay? They're not sharing. The atoms stick together in an ionic compound because one atom steals another atom's electrons, so electrons get stolen, and then opposite charges attract. Let me show you what I mean. So sodium chloride, or NaCl, is a very common ionic compound. It's made of sodium and chlorine. And here they are, just hanging out. Now for these two guys to stick together, here is what happens. The first thing that happens is chlorine reaches its green hand over and grabs an electron from sodium, okay, and it pulls it back. So now chlorine has an extra electron, and sodium has lost one of its electrons. This causes chlorine to now get a negative charge because it has a new electron, and sodium, because it, it had, had one of its electrons stolen, now it has a positive charge. So now we have a positively charged, charged ion here and another negatively charged ion. What do opposite charged things like to do? They like to come together. They stick together. They're attracted to each other just like magnets. So now we have a positively charged thing and a negatively charged thing. The arrows show how they're going to come together. And we end up with the two atoms stuck together because they're oppositely charged. And that's what holds ionic compounds together. So covalent or molecular compounds, the atoms are stuck together because they're sharing electrons with each other. Ionic compounds, the atoms are stuck together because one has stolen the other's electrons, it's given them opposite charges, and then those opposite charges have ah, let me try that again. And then those opposite charges, there we go, have attracted just like magnets. So this is one way that ionic and molecular compounds differ. Here is one more. So another big difference is how these compounds would actually look if we could see the atoms that make them up. So molecular or covalent compounds are made of molecules, which is a fancy word for a bunch of atoms that are stuck together in a clump. Here's what I mean. So sugar is a very common type of covalent compound, and it is made of molecules where it has these atoms here stuck together in a clump. Two carbons, and some four hydrogens, and two oxygens. So a grain of sugar would look like this. It would look like a number of different sugar molecules that have all kind of come together and formed a clump here. Okay, but the big deal here is that these molecules are individual clumps of atoms that then come together and make sugar. On the other hand, ionic compounds, they're not made of clumps of atoms like molecules. They're what we are what we they're made of what we call lattice structures. And here's what lattice structures example I'm going to give you is salt, which is sodium chloride, table salt. And the lattice structures of sodium chloride look like this. Look how different this is from the molecules that make up sugar. You have the sodium and the chloride atoms stuck together in this sort of very organized box-like shape. This is and your flip lesson will go into this a little bit more. What a lattice structure is. There aren't individual clumps 
of sodium chloride to which there are individual clumps of sugar. Instead, all the atoms are stuck together in this very regular shape. Now, one big important difference between covalent molecular stuff and ionic is what happens when they dissolve in water. These guys just come apart in the molecules, whereas the individual atoms come apart when an ionic compound dissolves in water. But uh, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. The other key thing I want to mention is in a covalent compound, you will note we truly do have two carbon, four hydrogen, and two oxygen. Whereas in sodium chloride, you have the simplest whole number ratio of ions. That's why when you formula write, you have to reduce. So that's another key difference. That's a very brief introduction to ionic versus covalent. We'll take a look at some of the examples, show you what some of the bonds look like, and show you different ways to determine if a compound is ionic or covalent. So some examples of covalent compounds are given, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water, hydrogen, etc. And you can see there you have two or more non-metals. But one other distinction I want to make clear, this will help you greatly with your project, which you'll get next week. If you have HCl, you name it as if it were an ionic compound, hydrogen chloride. However, hydrogen is, of course, a nonmetal. So this is a covalent compound. Be careful, for example, with hydrogen and a polyatomic ion. Again, you name it as if it were ionic, hydrogen nitrite, but this is a covalent molecule as well. And in the project, that sometimes comes back a little bit. Uh, the kids get a little bit confused there. We know that electrons are in orbitals, which are electron clouds. When atoms get close together, their orbitals can overlap, and you get what's known as a molecular orbital, where bonding electrons would be found. For example, if you had hydrogen chloride gas, hydrogen would link to the chlorine atom through a single bond. This single bond is a covalent bond and it represents one shared pair of electrons. If, for example, you had oxygen gas, and I'm going to teach you how to draw these next week, oxygen links to itself through a double bond, and that's two shared pairs of electrons. And nitrogen gas, for example, the N atoms link through a triple bond, and that's going to be three shared pairs of electrons. And you will learn that this right here, do you know what that is? No? Huh? They're valence, They're valence electrons. This is a lone pair of electrons. But these are valence electrons also, and we'll get into that. I'm not sure how much you learned in eighth grade. I think you learned how to do um, Lewis dot structures for atoms, but we're going to be doing them for compounds.
the energy required to break a bond and separate the atoms is known as bond energy. What do you think requires greater energy to break a single bond or a double bond? Double, double bond. So double bonds are stronger than single, triple bonds are stronger than both. You can't have quad bonds, they don't exist. When you build the compounds in the lab next week, you're going to see that the triple bond is the strongest. It is also the shortest. It requires twisting a little bit, and as a result, the bond length decreases. But bond energy is the energy required to break the bond between two atoms and then separate the atoms in the bond. The other term I want to mention is electronegativity. We've seen this one before. Electronegativity is the tendency of a bonded atom to attract those bonding electrons to itself. For example, with hydrogen chloride, or we could do hydrogen fluoride, And again, we'll go through how to draw the structures next week. If you look up electronegativity values on the back of the periodic table, hydrogen's 2.2, fluorine's 4.0. We know fluorine is the most electronegative atom on the periodic table. Well, this is a covalent bond, a single bond, in which you have a shared pair of electrons. When the electronegativity difference is rather large, that indicates that these electrons in the bond are not shared equally. It's like a tug of war between a big person and a very little person. That rope is going to go much toward the big person than the little person as he probably has more strength than somebody tiny. So the electrons in the bond are much more toward the fluorine than the hydrogen. And we'll take a look at what that means. We know elements have electronegativity values. We know they're on the back of the periodic table. The person who assigned these values to atoms is Linus Pauling. He is a pioneer in the field of biochemistry, determining many protein structures. Um, you can Google him and get a feel for just how many things he did. He was mildly involved with determining the structure of DNA, but whereas we know DNA is a double helix, his initial proposal was that it was a triple helix and he had groups facing in the wrong direction. It's probably his biggest blunder, but for one blunder he had a tremendous amount of success and we can take a look at some of that in a bit. As I said, fluorine is the most electronegative element and typically it's involved in a lot of ionic bonds, especially when it hooks up with the metal. And we already know that there is a periodic trend for electronegativity. As you go across the periodic table, the electronegativity does what? Increases, and as you go down a group, it decreases. So some of what we learned back in Chapter 4 is coming back. We're going to classify bonds into different types. We've got ionic, remember you're going to have metal, non-metal, this deals with the transfer of electrons, and we have covalent, and we're going to divide covalent into two groups. This is two or more nonmetals. This is a sharing of electrons between atoms. But with covalent, we have nonpolar and we have polar. 
with nonpolar, the electrons are shared equally. And with polar, the electrons, that is the bonding electrons, are shared unequally. But you don't get a transfer of electrons, so one doesn't have them all and the other doesn't lose them. That is to say, one doesn't lose one, but the other gains. This is just an unequal sharing. The way that we can determine whether a bond is nonpolar covalent or polar covalent is based on differences in electronegativity. For example, with the nonpolar covalent ones, for example, you can have two of the same atom. So the bonding electrons here are shared equally. So that would be, for example, hydrogen gas. Or you could have nitrogen gas. And again, I'll teach you how to draw these next week. So anytime you have two of the same, you're going to have a nonpolar covalent molecule, two nonmetals linked together that are the same. But you also can find this, for example, if N, this is not a molecule per se, but if N links to O, if I look up the electronegativities of these two atoms, I get 3.0 for nitrogen, and 3.4 for oxygen. The difference between these two values is relatively small, and I'll show you the dividing line. But this bond is nonpolar covalent. The electrons are considered to be shared equally because their electronegativity difference is small. You would see that also in the case of a P to H bond where both of these have electronegativity values of 2.2, or even carbon to hydrogen, this is a good one because it comes in handy, 2.5, 2.2. So when the electronegativity difference is small, we say the bond is nonpolar covalent. In contrast, when the electronegativity difference is larger, typically 0.5 to a certain upper end, we say the bond is polar. For example, hydrogen fluoride, H to F, what's the electronegativity value for hydrogen? 2.2 is correct. Fluorine, 4.0. So this difference is 1.8. That's pretty great. So these bonding electrons are not shared equally. Fluorine pulls the bonding electrons toward it, much more so than the hydrogen, and you get what's known as a dipole. That shows an unequal distribution of bonding electrons. You can also show partial charges that develop. You don't have ions, so you don't have a charge. But if fluorine pulls the electrons more toward itself than hydrogen, would it have a partial negative or a partial positive, pulling electrons toward itself? Partial negative. And this sign right here represents a partial negative. And this, a partial positive. 
So the more electronegative element pulls those electrons toward itself more. As a result, it has a partial negative charge as opposed to a partial positive. And last year in biology, you would probably have seen a water molecule and you may have seen a dipole going in this direction and that's because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen or you may have seen partial negative there, partial positive here on the hydrogen. Did you see something like that with water last year? Some of you yes, some of you no. So it probably was shown. It may not have stuck because it wouldn't have made sense. But that's what it represents. You have a covalent molecule. It's a polar covalent molecule because the bonding electrons are not shared equally. They're pulled more toward the oxygen than the hydrogens because oxygen is more electronegative. So a lot of what I've just said, explained, is written out in your notes, so you don't have to, you didn't have to scribble it all down. In an ionic bond, we said that the electrons are transferred from one atom to another, generating ions. For example, sodium fluoride is a whole network where you have sodium ions and fluoride ions. The sodium loses the electron, generating a sodium ion. The fluorine atom gains an electron, generating a fluoride ion. You can somewhat predict bond type based on differences in electronegativity. All you do is subtract the two values. I always do the big value minus the small value because you take the absolute value at the end, so make it easy for yourself. The larger the difference in electronegativity, the more polar the bond. Those of you who are quizzing, you should be finished up. It's just a 25-30 minute quiz. When the difference in electronegativity is less than 0.5, we say the bond is nonpolar covalent. Those are the small differences in electronegativity. A polar covalent bond is going to be between 0.5 and 2.1 inclusive, because less than or equal to. Some textbooks will argue that difference should only go to the upper end of 1.7. I've seen both. We'll stay with the 2.1, although you'll see where it really becomes a problem with certain compounds that are clearly ionic. And then ionic will be greater than 2.1. So let's take a look at these examples here. The first one says sodium bromide. Your approach here is to find the electronegativity values. What's the electronegativity value for sodium and bromine? So the electronegativity difference would be 2.1. And you would guess this as ionic because you have metal, non-metal, but the difference in electronegativity suggests that it's polar covalent even though it's not. So it's not a perfect system. How about lithium chloride? Lithium has an electronegativity value of chlorine. 3.2, right? Difference is 2.2 and this would be ionic. N to O, electronegativity for nitrogen. For oxygen, what's the difference? Bond would be nonpolar covalent. And then finally, we've got P and F. Phosphorus is 2.2, fluorine is 4.0, difference is 1.8, the bond would be polar covalent, okay?
pretty straightforward and I'll get your classwork to you in a few minutes but on your classwork this is similar to number one. The other thing I do want to mention again as the bond becomes more polar its bond strength will increase. You will see that ionic substances have much higher boiling and melting point temperatures than polar covalent ones or any type of covalent. The other thing I want to leave you with today is just some basic nomenclature so that next time we're really going to get into drawing the compound. So I just want to review a few key things that I think you probably have learned in middle school and definitely learned this year. We're going to learn how to draw compounds. Before we do so, we want to draw Lewis dot structures for elements. <coughs> We know that valence electrons are electrons in the outermost shell. They are involved in bonding. G. and Lewis developed a way to represent bonding in compounds, and dots are going to represent valence electrons. And I'm going to show you how to draw these Lewis structures for elements. When you're drawing them, you write the chemical symbol for the element, and you figure out how many valence electrons the element has. We already know how to do this from chapter four. You know the group number corresponds to the number of valence electrons for main group elements in the SNP block. We're gonna place the valence electrons around the chemical symbols and we're going to obey Hun's rule. Shown in this table, are elements in period two. I've listed the element, the group number, the electron config, how many valence electrons, again, you can see the correspondence with the group number, and what I want to show you, here's the new piece, is how to draw these Lewis dot structures. The symbol of the element, so let's just take something generic. Let's use the symbol X, for example, doesn't represent any element. That symbol is going to represent the nucleus and the core electrons. Around that symbol, there are four orbitals, 1s and 3ps. And within these orbitals, we will be placing valence electrons. For example, for lithium, lithium has one valence electron. I'm going to start right here in the upper part of that region. Beryllium has two, one, and now I spin. I spin counterclockwise. Boron. One, two, three, carbon. I am obeying Hun's rule, one in each orbital until pairing must occur. Nitrogen. Now I'm going to double up. I'll do it right here. Oxygen. Fluorine, and finally neon. Lewis dot structures, I would think you saw in middle school, correct? How come, like, before when we were doing it, you were going, like, two and right above each other? Oh, when I draw the compounds? Yeah. I'll show you how I move them afterward. But see nitrogen right here? Yeah. What happens is that stays as the lone pair, and then these electrons all move between, forming a triple bond in many cases. Or you might get a double bond and a single off this one, but you'll see the movement of them. That's a good question, and you'll see that. All right, 
So at this point, Lewis Dodge Structures, I did get a little bit further first hour, but I'm not concerned because we'll bridge the gap next time. Anybody watching the video from first hour, um, we did cover this piece right here, but it's a good place to pick up next time. Not a big deal at all. I'm going to give you your classwork. We're going to have time next week, and number one really is very simple, so I'm not very concerned with it. But you um, don't forget to watch the flip lesson for next time. You want to have mastery of that. And at this point, you just want to understand that covalent compounds are formed through the sharing of electrons, which differs from ionic, and that you can determine it by differences in electronegativity.